Hi there, welcome to another Q&A live session. My name is Rebecca and I am talking to you from OET here in Melbourne in Australia. And some of you may have joined me for speaking week last week. Uh, if you did, give me a thumbs up in the chat now, whether you're joining me live from Facebook or from YouTube, we're streaming to both of those channels at Official OET. So if you were part of speaking week last week, uh, give me a thumbs up. Uh, it'd be great to know uh, if you enjoyed the sessions or not. And uh, what I can share for you is uh, the speaking uh, new roll cards that we were talking about in speaking week last week. Let me put those into the chat. And uh, if you weren't able to join us last week, you can see the recordings now live from AS Official OET. The videos are there for you to watch again if you are unable to join. Um, and the roll cards uh, that uh, you're probably most interested in, so the new sample test five, I've just posted into uh, the chat uh, for you to look. Uh, so uh, on to today's session, which of course is much more simple, much more straightforward in some respects. I have no idea what to expect. I come to each of these Q&A live sessions uh, every fortnight and they're always different. There's always uh, some individual or interesting questions for me to answer. So all you need to do if you'd like me to help you with one of your preparation queries is to put your question into uh, the comment box in YouTube or Facebook. They both come through to me here and I work my way through as many of them as I can in the next hour. So I can see a lot of people already joining us. We've got over 200 people live, which is great to see. Thank you so much. Let's go to the comments and uh, see what the questions are coming through today. Um, all right, so welcome and hello to everybody saying hello in the chat at the moment. Um, here we go. Uh, so the first question coming through from Vu An on YouTube, I got 340 for speaking last attempt, and it's hard to know where I should focus to increase the score. Could you give me some tips? So obviously, uh, the speaking sessions that I just mentioned uh, that we delivered last week, those videos will be uh, really useful because what we did in those sessions uh, was I talked through the roll card and how you can make the most of preparation time, what sort of things you should be thinking about before doing your role play. But then I also played a number of real candidate samples, real candidates doing those uh, sample tests. And um, then we discussed during the sessions what was being done well and what wasn't being done so well. And I gave quite a lot of tips uh, about how uh, you could improve if you were going to do uh, that role play yourself or other role plays uh, preparing for OET. So if you didn't quite get the score that you want, I'd really recommend going and having a look at the video for your particular profession. And as I say, I'm sure you'll find lots of tips and strategies that you perhaps hadn't considered that could make the difference between getting that 340 and getting over 350, the B grade. Um, all right, good question to get us started. Let me, I've just lost my place, here we go. Um, lots of questions coming through. Oh, here's a nice one. Um, this is nice to share as well from Usman Ali, who's saying thank you to myself, my colleague Alex, but also Steve and Hami, um, who are our all stars, uh, to let us know that you have passed your OET test. So that's really good news. Congratulations to you, and we wish you all the best uh, for the future. Um, Intisar, also, I think, on uh, YouTube, um, the program I'm aiming for requires OET 400 in each of the sections. Any preparatory advice or general tips for such scores? So 400 in a raw score is like a mid um, OET B grade. It is a, a high level of proficiency in English. And I know if you're uh, aiming at getting a 400 in each of the sections, 
in each of the sections, that's quite a lot of pressure, that's quite a lot of stress uh, to be under. So obviously um, the, the general guidance and support that we give to our candidates is mainly aiming at candidates wanting to get a 350. Uh, so in terms of listening and reading, we recommend uh, for getting a score of 350, you're needing to aim between 30, 31, 32 questions to be correct um, in listening and reading. So if you're aiming at a 400, you're obviously needing to aim higher than that. So um, mid 30s, uh, probably, uh, or into the high 30s, to be confident of getting a 400 on uh, your test. And uh, for writing and speaking, we're generally recommending that candidates are getting within a band five um, for the linguistic criteria or the um, uh, the writing criteria and for the clinical communication criteria aiming at uh, twos. But if you're aiming at a 400, again, obviously you need to be uh, looking for some of those scores to be a six or a seven uh, to be feeling more comfortable that you're going to get the 400 on test day. And I really think uh, you'll want some support to get ready for your test um, if you do need to get scores as high as 400. So I'm going to post a link into the chat, just getting it off my screen, um, to our recommended teachers uh, who would be able to really work with you on what current language level you have, what your current strengths and weaknesses are, and also to work to improve those with you. All right. Um, this question uh, from Esnat on YouTube. Uh, what do I need to go with in an exam room? So um, you will need with you on test day uh, your ID. That's probably the most important document that you need to make sure you have with you. Uh, because when you get to registration, you must present the same ID um, at registration as you did when you booked your test. So your ID is really, really important. Actually in the test room with you, uh, you can take a clear plastic uh, water bottle, uh, but that water bottle must not have any writing on it. Um, and then it depends whether you're taking OET on paper or OET on computer. If it's on computer, then it's just the water bottle that you are allowed in the room with you. If it's OET on paper, then you can take your test day stationery, your pens, your pencils, pencil sharpener, eraser, whatever you prefer to write with during your test, which is either a pen or a pencil. Um, and uh, you can find more information uh, about things like that, what can be taken into the test room. Again, from the OET website, uh, we have something called the Ultimate Guide to Test Day. Um, I'm just going to look up the link for you now, and I can post that into the chat uh, for you to refer to. So just give me a second while that comes up. Um, all right, so this is the paper version. However, if you want the computer version, uh, then please do go to the OET website and search for ultimate guide to test day and you'll see the uh, computer version comes up in the uh, results all right um let's have a look for another question um here we go from mohammed uh do i have to expand on the purpose of the letter near the end of the letter or is it enough for it to be stated in full in the introduction? Now, in some cases, um, stating the purpose at the front really covers all of the details required, and there wouldn't be any reason to return to it at the end of the letter. But I would say more often than not, uh, it's good practice and quite helpful for the reader if you follow the approach of treating your letter like a circle. So at the beginning of your letter, you explain briefly the purpose, which is your reason for writing to that reader. Uh, and then towards the end of your letter in the final paragraph, 
you return back to the beginning um, by going into that purpose in more detail. So making your specific requests um, and uh, closing off uh, the information that the reader uh, is required to, to follow. So it can be done both ways, uh, but I would suggest more, more often than not, uh, you would mention the purpose briefly at the beginning and again in more detail at the end. Um, great. Um, let's have a look for another question. Sorry, my page just skipped down a long way. Uh, here we go. Um, so let's go for uh, another question. All right. Oops, no, that's this one. Uh, so from Rex, I want some more practical tips on sequencing and structuring of the tasks. Uh, so I think this um, applies to speaking. And again, this was something that came up quite a lot during the speaking week sessions last week. We were talking about organizing the information uh, so that it was clear for the listener to understand, but also making sure you give uh, the speaker, uh, sorry, the listener opportunity to contribute. So I was describing the role play like a game of tennis. Um, so if you think about tennis and if you hit the ball, the ball can only be in the air for so long before it has to come down and land and your opponent will return it to you. So you should think of that as your speech, like the ball. Uh, it's only got a certain amount of time that you should continue speaking before you imagine um, that your listener needs to respond to you. And that's part of sequencing and structuring as well that you need to um, organize uh, the information and not provide too much detail before checking with the uh, listener that they've understood if they have any questions, uh, if they're comfortable with what you are suggesting. Uh, this question from Jibby on YouTube talking about reading parts B and C. Well, let me pick up on reading part B for now. Um, so if I just bring up um, I've got a page of tips that I can show you. And if I hide the comment, we can see uh, the page in full. So a few tips here for reading part B. Uh, the first tip is remember that each question is completely individual. Uh, so you don't need to um, pass or get the correct answer to any one of those six questions to be also able to answer the next question correctly. So treat each one different individually. If you find one particularly difficult, don't let that uh, concern you, you know, move on to the next one, which is a completely new question. You've got equal opportunity to getting that answer correct, even if you found the previous question more dif difficult. Uh, when you're reading the text, look for evidence to support your choice. So don't just look for words that are repeated either in the question or in the answer option in the text. Look for actual evidence that proves uh, that one answer option completely is covered by words in the text. And I would also make sure as part of looking for that evidence that you read the sentence where you think the answer is found more than once. So don't just make a very quick snap decision. Um, make sure you've read that carefully once and compare it with the answer option to fully check, as I said, that it, it really covers all of that answer option before selecting it as your answer. So a couple of tips there. I'll come back to reading part C perhaps a little later on. All right, so um, let's have another question. Here we go. Um, oh, we've got another nice um, encouraging comment. This one from Porva who um, has been able to get two A's and a B 
two Bs, sorry, two A's, two Bs, just from your first attempt. Um, and thanking myself and Steve, one of our premium providers, uh, for our support in that process. So well done to you. Congratulations. Kennedy uh, says, if I fail one of my exams, let's say writing, can I repeat writing only or do I have to repeat all the exams? So Kennedy, this is a decision made by the regulator that you are planning to apply to with your OET results. So regulators like the GMC, the NMC, the ECFMG, APRA, sorry, that's lots of acronyms. Hopefully some of those are familiar to you. They make decisions about which results they will accept um, and they make a decision as well about resits. Now, most of those regulators uh, do require you to resit all four subtests each time you take the test, regardless of whether you got the score required for three of the other subtests or not. But to be absolutely sure, we do recommend contacting the regulator directly, telling them your situation, and they can advise you specifically to their requirements. Uh, meme on YouTube says, uh, in writing, do we have to capitalize the first letter of medication names? So this is a punctuation rule uh, around medication. So you're probably familiar with there being two names generally for each medication. One is the generic scientific name for the, uh, the medication. Uh, so for example, aspirin is um, the generic name for that particular medication and then you will find uh, a brand name which it is sold by in the pharmacy in the supermarket wherever it is that you get your medication from and those brand names uh, could be related to the generic name or they could be something completely different um, it is the generic name that is not capitalized and the brand name that is. So if you are writing a brand name in your letter, then the first letter should be capitalized. However, if it's a generic name, there's no need to capitalize it. And, and in most cases, official OET case notes will provide both the generic or the and the brand name, sorry. And you can choose probably for your reader using the generic name is sufficient and suitable. Um, great. Um, this question on Facebook um, from C. Lau saying, my friends booked their test for the July 9th. However, they received an email saying that they withdrew from the exam. They claimed that they didn't send any email of withdrawal. I can't comment exactly on uh, what has happened there. However, I would recommend your friends contact OET customer service directly. The easiest way to do that is via live chat. So if you go to the OET website, occupationalenglishtest.org, uh, you'll find a green help button on uh, the front page of the website. And clicking that means you can start chatting with one of our customer service operators. They're available 24 hours a day, Monday to Friday, and they can look up your friend's account and let them know what's going on, if anything, and uh, solve the issue for them. Cinderella on uh, Facebook says, um, if I write um, pump, pump instead of bump in the listening part A, would this be considered wrong. Yes, Cinderella, I think unfortunately this would be um, considered wrong because what you have written there doesn't really resemble the correct answer. Um, and from what is written, the assessors wouldn't be able to guess if you had identified correctly the word uh, that formed the answer. Um, so it is important that during the, the time you're provided with to check your responses, uh, that you do check spelling. It doesn't always have to be 100% perfect, but it does need to be pretty accurate. And so checking your spelling during that time um, that is allocated for checking of answers 
uh, it's something important that you should do. Mariam is asking about uh, the new roll cards. Yes, uh, Mariam, I started the session by giving the good news that the roll cards from last week's speaking week are now available from the sample test page of the OET website. And I posted a link uh, to it in the chat. So perhaps if you scroll back to the beginning of the comments, you'll find that link to access. Uh, Abinya is saying, uh, can we write uh, thank you for accepting Mr. So-and-so back into your care when it is a known case? Potentially, uh, you could use um, this, this phrase. Um, that would be a, a way of demonstrating that the, the reader already knows this patient and, in fact, um, they are being uh, cared for uh, by this, this reader. Potentially, this is a discharge letter. So this would be one option. Another option could be, you know, I'm writing to discharge Mr. X back into your care. You, you'd need to make a judgment based on the case notes. Um, thank you for accepting suggests that um, the reader has agreed to Mr. X coming back into their care. Um, I'm guessing in most cases, for example, if the patient is returning to an aged care facility or the place where they're usually living, um, there's nothing to be agreed on. It's just going to happen. Um, so if if it is you know, mo much more like a discharge, then perhaps using the verb discharge would be more appropriate to accepting. Uh, but you can make that judgment, as I say, on the individual case notes uh, that you are uh, looking at. Uh, Zulfikar on Facebook says um, there was an NMC meeting. Did they recommend any changes in OET overall? Uh, so some of you may be aware that the Nursing and Midwifery Council in the UK are currently going through a consultation period. They do this every few years to check the standards that they are accepting uh, for certain requirements uh, of nurses. At the moment, they're doing a consultation into the language requirements they make of nurses applying to the NMC. And as part of that consultation process, they are thinking about whether the grades uh, that they require from nurses are appropriate or not. That consultation process is ongoing and uh, they will report uh, their decisions uh, in the next couple of months. Um, but uh, from what we understand so far, there will be no changes to the results required by nurses applying to the NMC. Um, all right, this question from Marina. In writing, if a patient receives education which needs to be continued further, is it all right to use he has been advised? So, for example, he has been advised to continue the deep breathing exercises. Yes, that would be absolutely fine um, to use that form uh, in, in that example. Um, Balen on YouTube says, how would I know if the OET test will be on paper or computer based? Uh, this will be because you have booked that uh, test type when you come to register for OET. So when you're making a booking to take OET, you can select either a paper venue or a computer venue. Uh, and that's down to your preference, but also um, perhaps what test venue is most local to you and that will be uh, most convenient for you to get to. Roderick on Facebook says, should I bring my own headphones? Uh, no, uh, the headphones that you will use if your venue is using headphones, which is um, the case in all computer venues, um, the, the listening is always done uh, through headphones, uh, they will provide the headphones for you. If you're taking OET on paper uh, and the venue uses headphones for listening, they will also supply them. So you shouldn't bring your own headphones to the test. They won't be accepted. Uh, 
Um, great. Uh, here we go. Chinchu on YouTube says, uh, could you please tell me is all diets we are writing countable like a low carbohydrate diet? Yes, that's correct. Um, there are many different types of diet that a patient could be following. And so we would use uh, an, uh, an article there to, to, to show the one that the patient themselves is eating. So it could be a diabetic diet, a low carbohydrate diet, a high protein diet. Uh, but yes, an article would be used. Uh, Lynn on YouTube is saying um, how many lines are needed for a letter. There's no particular answer to that question, uh, Lynn. Um, the focus of your writing time is obviously to produce a complete letter uh, that communicates all the information the reader needs to continue, to continue care for the patient as per the request that you are making of them. Now, there's a guided word limit for the paragraphs of your letter, uh, which is between 180 to 200 words. Um, but that is just a guide. You don't need to count your words and make sure that you have included within that guide uh, exactly. Um, but it's there to remind you that in the 40 minutes time that you have available, uh, you should sort of limit your writing uh, to only including the information that is really relevant to the current situation um, and to the current reader and not include unnecessary information uh, that isn't relevant. So both of those things are part of the assessment criteria, making sure everything that the reader needs is included and omitting information that the reader would find irrelevant All right, uh, Ritika is coming back to the question of reading part C. Uh, so let me show you um, some tips on the screen again. Let me just bring up uh, the reading part C tips page. So I think in reading part C, a lot of candidates struggle with the timing of this. So there's 45 minutes allowed for both reading part B and reading part C. And it's important that you manage your time well uh, for this part of the test. So we recommend allowing around 10 minutes maximum to complete the six reading part B questions. And then that will leave you with 35 minutes to complete reading part C of which, again, you need to split your time almost equally between the two texts, so around 15 to 17 minutes for each text, and then there's eight questions to answer. So you do need to practice, and this will perhaps take some time to practice and get better at answering each question in roughly one minute. Um, and so building up your stamina, obviously, to read and concentrate for that amount of time, but also being able to move on, making a decision about which um, answer option is correct uh, so that you are moving through the questions and finding time to answer all of the questions. Like I was suggesting uh, for reading part B, uh, while you are reading, you should be looking for evidence, so not just matching keywords that are used in the question and in the text or from one of the answer options and in the text, you're really looking in the paragraph uh, where the answer is contained uh, for evidence of why that answer is right, as well as why uh, the other answer options are wrong. They will all be mentioned somehow and within that section of text. And that's a good strategy to making sure you feel confident that you have picked the right answer uh, by being able to find that evidence, as I say, of why one is right and the others are wrong. Another tip uh, that you can try is uh, covering up the answer options with your hand uh, while you only read the question and then looking at uh, the section where the answer is given um, and trying to find the answer to the question yourself 
before you look at the answer options. And that avoids being distracted by the different answer options. If you found what you think is the answer in the text, you can then compare that sentence with those answer options to make sure that what you think is right is one of the answer options and it covers that answer option completely. All right. Um, good stuff. Oops, I didn't mean to click that. I meant to click that. Uh, all right, here's another question. Um, Kingfoot is asking, can you kindly help me with the difference between the types of letter? Yes, certainly. So most OET professions will be writing a referral letter, which means to introduce the patient to another health professional. This could be a, a professional who is going to provide a second opinion or a specialist opinion. It could be another health professional, uh, perhaps in the allied professions like physiotherapy or dietetics, who's going to uh, provide a treatment pathway for the patient. So referral letter is really the most commonly used letter. Uh, but as in real life, there are a couple of other options uh, that you might be asked to write a letter about. Uh, so the second one is a discharge letter. Perhaps you have been caring for the patient in hospital and uh, the letter is now discharging the patient, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, back to a retirement home where they usually live or back to the care of their regular community clinic, uh, their doctor or nurse that they regularly see. So uh, that would be the second type. And the third type is a transfer letter. And this is where you are transferring the care of the patient from yourself, again, to another healthcare professional, perhaps because the patient is moving location. Um, and so you are transferring the care of, of them from yourself to the new healthcare professional in a new location. Now, although there are those three options, and for some of our other OET professions, there is the option of an information letter, uh, or a complaint letter. Uh, the way that you approach all of those letters is actually the same. You're looking at the writing task to find out why you are writing to this reader. Uh, and then you are looking through the case notes to find the information that would be relevant and that the, uh, the reader would need communicated to be able to continue that care. Uh, great question. Let me scroll down now a little bit further to some more recent comments coming in. Um, this question from Venita says, I'm writing to refer Mrs. May Hong, who has been diagnosed with pneumonia, requires further assessment and management. It's a pretty good sentence, um, but I can see one mistake, and that is instead of the comma, you need to remove the comma and use the word and. So who has been diagnosed with pneumonia and requires further assessment and management, and then that would be a very good sentence. Ambika on Facebook says, could you please share previous writing case notes for reference? Uh, OET does not release previous test papers to candidates, um, uh, but we do make available practice tests, like we've just released a new roll card for speaking. Um, and as well as the practice tests available within the OET website, in the OET shop, uh, we have a practice book of tests that you can purchase. And there are a number of other study books uh, that are available for you to purchase from the OET shop as well. And those study books uh, not only give you some practice tests, but also skills and strategies to help you develop your skills into strengths uh, as you are preparing. Um, all right. Um, 
Sorry, my computer is jumping around a little bit tonight. I'm not sure if the internet connection is a little bit dodgy. Um, this question from Lynn is um, for a salutation, sir or madam is the old version or we can use it. Um, so I'm not sure what you mean by old version. Uh, candidates often contact OET and say, what are the updates? What has changed? And nothing ever really changes at OET. Uh, we always give out the same advice, the same recommendations. There's certainly been no changes to the test papers, the format or the way the test is assessed. The advice that we've always given to candidates is if you are not given the reader's name in the writing task, then to use their job title. So for example, dear nursing director, dear doctor, dear community health nurse, whatever their job title is given, then that is preferable to sir or madam. Uh, it's a little bit more specific and respectful to use their job title uh, in a healthcare profession. Um, Ria says, can we write domiciliary care instead of home care while writing the purpose? I don't think I'd particularly recommend this um, because I think there's a possibility for confusion by what you mean. Home care is a very standardised phrase within the nursing profession. And I think um, domiciliary care is probably less familiar and may not even have exactly the same meaning. Um, so if you're asking this question because you think you need to change all of the words provided for you into your own words, that's not actually correct. You don't. You can use uh, some of the words provided in the case notes exactly as written in your letter. You will, of course, be adding the words around uh, the words that you use from the case notes uh, to demonstrate your own language proficiency, but you can copy words from the case notes into your letter. Kieran on YouTube uh, says, if I'm writing a letter to a social worker, do I need to write medication and symptoms of the client? For any letter, um, regardless of the reader, you only need to include information that the reader will need to be able to continue care for the patient. And I know I've said that a few times now this session. Um, so that means if the, the reader is not going to be monitoring the patient's medication, um, is not going to have any future involvement in their compliance or whether the dose gets changed or not, uh, then you won't need to include that information in your letter. And the same with the symptoms. If the symptoms the patient is experiencing now is not something that the reader is going to be paying attention to, uh, then potentially you don't need to include that information in the letter either. So you're always thinking about, is this relevant to the reader or not? Um, Vianne on Facebook says, when the card says you have just examined the patient, how do I start? Do I have to introduce myself? So this was something that came up quite a few times in the speaking week sessions last week. So again, if you haven't uh, had a chance to view the video for your profession, make sure you visit at official OET YouTube and you can find uh, the videos there from the recently released videos and have a look. Um, if it says you've just examined the patient, then you don't need to start with introductions. Uh, and you can ask the patient's name during your preparation time. Uh, and that way you could start, for example, uh, so Rebecca, I've had a look at your knee. Um, can you tell me some more about how you sustained the injury? And that would be completely fine uh, to start the card in such a case. This question from D, which is also about speaking. Um, do I have to speak facing the interlocutor eye to eye, or am I allowed to look at my card while speaking? 
you certainly can look at your card while speaking if you're needing to pick up some details or to check some information that you want to um, to give as part of what you're saying. Um, we would recommend making eye contact when possible, as you would uh, when speaking to a real patient, because we think that helps to create uh, the rapport between yourself and the interlocutor and uh, to feel like this is uh, not a test, but actually a real conversation. It can actually help you to relax, to imagine that this is a real conversation and to act as if it is one. Uh, but you don't need to be making that eye contact all of the time. You can certainly check your card when you need to. Uh, this question from Shiny says, can we write, he was managed with intravenous antibiotics, dressing and physiotherapy? You could certainly write, he was managed with intravenous antibiotics and physiotherapy. Um, dressing on its own is not correct. Um, as an individual verb like that, um, it means obviously to put your clothes on. Uh, whereas I think you mean, um, obviously, dressing of the wound. Um, so I'm not sure I would exactly include those three items in the one sentence, but I would need to look at the case notes to know exactly how I would communicate that information there, um, which I can't do, obviously, on, on this session now. Um, all right. This question from uh, Princey. Um, would you mind telling me if we need to change the paragraph that we have already written? Is there any chance to change it without erasing? Yes, if you need to make some edits um, to what you have written, uh, you can erase it. Or if you've written it in pen, or even if you've written it in pencil, you can simply draw one a line through the middle of the words that you don't wish to be read and uh, write either write the the words above if there's space um, in the line or if you've got big writing you might need to write those um, words or sentence at the end of your letter and then use an arrow to show where that word or sentences should be read in your letter those sorts of editing um, marks like the arrows are acceptable to the OET assessors. Uh, Minimal is giving me another chance to mention the Speaking Week videos. Uh, so can you please upload a video with a candidate that met all the criteria while speaking? I think if you listen to those videos from last week, you'll certainly get a sense of some of the candidates that uh, performed very strongly in their particular role play. Um, and I gave an overall summary of the strengths and weaknesses of the different candidates. So you get a sense of which ones were doing things very well, which ones needed some improvement. And I think the combination of all of that information and listening to the different candidates will really give you a good sense of, of your own speaking and what you might need to do to improve. Mohammed um, says, will the background information or the social data always be written in the last paragraph or is there other options? So the way that you organize your letter really depends on which information the reader would find most essential. So we recommend that candidates structure their letter in order of importance for the reader. And that can be done in a couple of different ways. It can be done chronologically, um, if that's going to be the most organized and clear way for the reader to understand the information. So what happened on which day and how that has changed in, in the time since. Or thematically, um, so covering th things off by topics such as social information or background information. Now, it really depends on why you are writing to the reader as to which information um, they will consider more important than not. And if the background information, the social information is 
really important in terms of it would have a large impact on how the reader is going to continue care for the patient, then it could be given near the start of the letter. So that's certainly the way that you need to think about it. What would the reader want to know about first? What would they then want to know about second and so on? Yinka um, is saying, what is the correct format to write a date in writing? And there are several uh, correct and accepted formats for writing the date. Uh, you can write it all in numbers and separating the numbers using slashes um, or dots. You can also write the date in words and both are acceptable. Um, and you can choose which you prefer. But our recommendation would be that you use the same date format throughout your letter so that it's, it's, uh, it looks coherent and is not confusing to the reader. Vinita says he was initiated with physiotherapy. Is it correct? So when it comes to therapies like physiotherapy or chemotherapy or occupational therapy, uh, the, the most uh, normal verb that we use with those therapies uh, is commenced or perhaps even underwent, but not really initiated. And we would also make this sentence active. This is currently a passive sentence. Um, so we would uh, instead say, he has um, commenced physiotherapy uh, and that is uh, an active sentence and uh, much more naturally used uh, in English. Adju on Facebook says, after listening part A is two minutes um, available to recheck the answers. So this depends on the way that you are taking OET. If you are taking OET on paper, two minutes are given at the end of the second uh, part C audio for you to check all of your answers to part A, part B and part C. So the two minutes is given right at the end of the listening test for you to check your answers. If you're taking OET on computer as a venue, uh, then there is time built in to the end of each audio, um, some extra seconds for you to check your answers as you go along. So it does depend which way you're taking the test. Sujana says, may I know what would be the estimated score when the letter is ended at the request paragraph without a complete request? I can't give you an estimated score. What I can remind you or tell you about is that the way writing is assessed uh, means that um, your letter is judged in its overall communication. The assessor has six assessment criteria to to score your writing with and they're looking for a strong performance against all of the assessment criteria so if you've just not had time to include the ending to your letter that could impact your score slightly for uh, organization and layout which is where the opening and closing of the letter is assessed uh, but if everything else was done well it may not have a significant enough impact to change the final score that you were likely to have got if you had managed to complete the entire letter Divya on YouTube says, uh, may I know which one will be better? I am writing to refer Mr. X or Mr. X requires further monitoring. Both of those options could be absolutely fine. Um, and it really depends on the who is reading the letter, uh, whether they know the patient, in which case uh, the second option could be more appropriate or if you are introducing them for the first time, in which case the first option is more likely to be correct. Uh, 
Uh, Alina is asking from YouTube, which are the common accents used in listening? So the accents for the listening test uh, commonly come from the UK, from Australia and America. But as you're very familiar, there are a number of varieties of accents within each of those countries. Um, and so it could be those uh, accents from any of those countries. But remember that uh, the voices are recorded to be clear and at slightly slower speed than what would be considered native speaker speed, uh, as, as would be appropriate for a language test. And the other thing that is uh, part of the recording is if there are two voices in any of the audios, one voice will be male and one voice will be female to make it really clear uh, and to be able to distinguish between the two speakers at any time. Shima on YouTube says, can we write the marriage status and number of children in the RE line? This wouldn't be recommended. The purpose of the RE line, which stands for reference line, is uh, to enable the reader to uh, identify the patient that you are writing to them about. So the way that I recommend candidates think about this is uh, the reader receives your letter and types the patient's name into their computer to bring up their database. Um, the database perhaps brings up two patients with the same name. So they then confirm which is the, the right patient for this letter using the date of birth that's also provided in the reference line. No other details like marriage status or number of children are things that can confirm a patient's identity. Uh, and that's why those are not included in that line. It's really just for the name and the patient's date of birth. Uh, Vivian on Facebook uh, says for urgent letters, uh, the paragraph should be written, um, the action paragraph should be written in the last paragraph or can be after the purpose paragraph. Uh, for urgent letters, generally you will start uh, by explaining what has just happened to make this situation urgent, uh, but then you are likely to go back through the patient's history leading up to what has uh, caused the, the current situation. In all letters, um, putting the requests at the end is the standard position and the one that is recommended. So even though the situation is urgent, you should still finish your letter with the request that you're making of the reader so that that's the last thing that they read and they know what it is that they need to do uh, straight away. Munir says, is it okay to write, I prescribed? Yes, certainly if you are a doctor or pharmacist or another healthcare profession um, with that ability to prescribe medication and you were personally responsible for that prescription, you can certainly write it um, in an active sentence um, in, your, in your letter. Chijo um, is asking on Facebook, uh, there are a lot of messages on social media that you can answer the exam for a penny. A lot of students are cheating. Some people get the same questions. Why doesn't OET take action against it? In fact, we do take action against uh, these messages that we see on social media. Um, we take uh, as quick an action as is possible as soon as these sites or messages or, uh, come to our attention. Um, we, are, we have a, an organization that we employ that their job is to have those uh, sites and posts removed from social media because they do mislead candidates. We also regularly 
post reminders on our own Facebook page um, of fraudulent activity that candidates need to be, be to be aware of and to avoid uh, because obviously um, we don't want our candidates to fall into those traps that are usually ways of um, stealing money from you uh, by suggesting that they have uh, the coming test answers or they can give you um, an OET statement of result without you having even taken the test. None of those things are possible. So we do post those regular reminders uh, that that is fraudulent activity uh, and that you should uh, avoid that, be careful about it. Um, if you are aware of any sites or messages circulating social media, we strongly recommend that you report those to OET so that we can take action against uh, them. And I'm just looking for the link uh, to share with you. Um, just having to move my uh, site a little bit just to look for the information that I need. Uh, where is it? Ah, here we go. Sorry, you're having to look at me being a bit funny there. Uh, so here is a link where you can share any um, suspicious activity or uh, examples of people offering, suggesting that they're offering um, free OET certificates or answers or such like. Uh, so please do let us know and, and we will take action against it because we take such matters very, very seriously. Uh, Roderick says, um, in listening, if I hear shortness of breath as my answer, can I write SOB instead? I can understand the question, but the answer is you must write what you hear on the audio. And that is part of the instructions given that you need to write a word or phrase that you hear in the audio. Um, so please do follow those instructions carefully and only write uh, what you hear. All right, I'm going to answer one more question and uh, then I will um, tell you what's coming up uh, next this week from our All Stars. Um, agree Zolfika, who's saying don't pay attention to the scams. So this is the last question coming through from Raphael. Are the speaking and writing components evaluated by health professionals? Yes, uh, well, when you say evaluated, uh, before those test materials are used by candidates in the test, they are evaluated by health professionals to make sure that the information you are seeing is accurate for your profession and uh, the, the terminology being used is being used accurately. When uh, your papers are assessed, so once you've completed your speaking test, uh, they are not evaluated by health professionals, uh, but they are evaluated by language experts. So because OET is a test of your English, uh, they are assessing you on the communication that you have provided, either by writing or speaking, not the accuracy of your medical knowledge, uh, just the accuracy of your communication. <coughs> Excuse me. So for those of you interested in more preparation, uh, coming up this week, we have two live sessions from our OET All-Stars, our very popular OET All-Stars. Uh, so coming up a little bit later uh, this week, tomorrow, in fact, uh, we've got um, Steve from OET Online, who will be uh, leading um, another of his prep hours with Steve, a very popular um, choice. And on Thursday, we have SLC, um, who will be uh, also running one of their sessions. Uh, so two really good sessions uh, for you to look out for. And I'm just trying to bring up uh, the topics of those sessions to see if uh, those will be something you'd really like to to watch. Um, so the OET online session let's just bring that up, is going to be on speaking. Um, and it's really focusing on the clinical communication criteria for effective 
communication. So that's going to be a good session. Perhaps you attended Speaking Week last week and you want to continue building on those skills this week. Steve will be delivering on speaking. And on Thursday, uh, SLC will have a session on reading and particularly on reading part A and making sure you avoid common mistakes um, in terms of spelling. So two really good sessions coming up and I hope you're going to be able to join uh, in for those. I will be back uh, in a couple of weeks time. Um, so if you will want to prepare more questions to ask me, uh, do join me again in a couple of weeks time. Uh, the details are there on the screen now. Um, so they will be um, Wednesday the 13th of July uh, if you are um, uh, over in the States that will be afternoon time there or evening time if you are in Europe very early in the morning if you are closer to home where I am um, here in Australia. So thank you so much uh, for joining me today. Um, let's get rid of that uh, so you can see me again. It's been lovely answering all of your questions and I will see you again soon. Bye for now.